Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of We Talk Photo, and this is the fall edition of uh, our podcast. I'm uh, one of your hosts, John Peterson, and with me always is Jack, Mr. Jazz Graham. Don't, don't, uh, <laughs> if you, anybody's wondering why, if those of you that are watching this on audio, for those of you that don't have audio, I'm sitting here smiling and kind of laughing. And and I, I, I'm glad to be here. We'll get into that, but um, we just had a had a funny little couple minutes before we went live here, and we came up with a great title for the podcast. In the event that we ever do want to get out of this business, yeah. and uh, I can't say it here because yeah, PG still rated. Be listening. <laughs> but it was a great rated. title. It was a great title. Hey yeah. everybody, thank you for being here. I'm I'm happy to be with you today. You betcha. Yeah. Yeah. Glad to be back. Glad to be here. We uh, we had a guest schedule this morning and uh, unfortunately they got sick. So we'll reschedule them. And today it's just. You want to tease that, John? Jack and John. Let's no, tease go, that. Yeah, go ahead. Let's tease that. Um, there's a photographer over in actually Andy lives in Lisbon, Portugal, but he is a, a, a British, a British photographer. And one of my favorite photographers and uh, has some great stuff to offer for all of you. And his name is Andy. And last name is Andy is Mumford, Andy Mumford, M-U-M-F-O-R-D. <clears throat> if you all would like to check Andy out prior to uh, our, we got to record with him. We were supposed to do it today, but he came down with a cold. So we're going to do it next week. And we'll, it'll, this will be up in about a week, uh, hopefully. Check his website and YouTube stuff out. Andy Mumford. So Andy's going to be with us. It's going to be great. Yep, yep. It will be good. Be and the, and he his work really resonates with both of us. I think Jack and 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 I think you nailed it earlier today when you said it's because he's one of those simple. He simplifies. He distills scenes into very very yeah simple yet very strong uh, statements and. That's something that resonates with with both you and I. I know. Yeah, we we constantly, you know, we were talking. What, what are we going to talk about on this podcast? Because we don't have a guest, you know. So obviously, with me here, there's usually not a lack of verbiage that goes <laughs> on. But um, you know, we we keep talking about simplicity and how to slow down and all that stuff. But you know, for those of you who may have not been on a workshop with John and I. By the time we're done, and those of you who have will verify this, by the time you're done after a few days with us, you're sick and tired of hearing slow down, slow down, slow down, simplify. Mm -hmm. And Andy does that so well, and it's something that we constantly harp on much more than, you know, the, the stuff that you've read in books for 90 years. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, uh, somebody asked me, you know, I have this, believe it or not, I do have a YouTube channel. I think there's like three videos up on it and they they've asked, why don't you do a YouTube channel? And I'm trying to come up, you know, John's going to be expanding his, he's got some great ideas. Uh, maybe I'll steal one or two. It'd be great. But you know, how many times could you talk about, you know, how to become this or how to do this? It's been, it's been done. It's been rehashed. 80 million times. That's one of the reasons I think outdoor photographer one magazine went away. How many times can you talk about seven tips to fall photography? And by the way, I'll give you guys all a tip. You ready? Yeah. Okay. Number one, most important tip for fall photography. Photograph between September 1st and November 15th. Wow. Think about that. Yeah. Well, that's right and up there. I, with... I'm being sarcastic here, yeah. but that's, that's what we've been dealing with for years, you know, and polarize for this and do this and put your subject here. And it's been done and been done very well by a lot of people. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I'll, I'll kind of stand on that YouTube thing, Jack, though. I'll tell you that, that there's, you know, I think I've said this before, there's a lot of people out there with great information about how to do something, how to do it, you know, how to fix yeah. your toaster, how to yep. shoot fall photography, how to do this, how to do that. But there's not a lot of people teaching the why. 
Yeah. Why do I do this? Yeah. What does it mean to be an artist? How do you, I mean, I'm working on a, a presentation, speaking of stealing ideas, I stole your, one of your ideas for an Excellent. upcoming, uh, the speech bill I have to give. I get on... the bill out today. Yeah, you're welcome. I, um, we can't make any money, you know, doing anything else with the. Oh, I know, but <laughs> it's 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 about being an artist, not a camera owner. You know, it's along that same line. How do you, how do we be an artist? And and that speaks to the why we do certain things in the field and what we look for, not how to do it. Let me tell you, when I was in the music business, the the local eight hundred two book in new york was it was about six by seven size and it was about that thick it was about two inches thick this and is a telephone book this is a telephone book and and there was a you know there was like 80 pages of trumpet players yeah. I'm, I'm serious and you you had a you know they all played great a lot of them most of them played great and Man, you had to you had to get really good, and the only way to get good in this business, I'm sorry, it's not buying a new camera. Read some of read. Go back and read John Shaw's books. If you want to read, go back and read John's books. You buy them on eBay for about five bucks a piece. Yeah, they're written about film, but the principles are the same. But man, you gotta you gotta become an artist. Mm -hmm. You gotta become, mm -hmm. and 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 it. It takes time. It's a factor of time. Everything in art, I don't care if you're cooking, if you're writing, if you're playing an instrument, it's all a factor of time and you have to put the time in. Anyhow, we're being repetitive here. They, yes. People have heard us from that. But um, yeah, but we had a couple of great trips. Um, I had, I had uh, one and eight tenths what, what would that one, be? And, one and three quarters? Yeah. One and four fifths of, 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 of trips. I actually came home a day early from the last trip. We'll get into that. But let's get into that now and get it out of the way. Yeah. Um, I've gotten a lot of emails from people that I know that, that have asked, why did you pull your workshops for 2024 other than, uh, I think, two or three off your website? And the reason is the reason I came home from our Sierra trip a day early. Um, I developed um, over the course of the last, I would say, I don't know, maybe maybe going back four or five months, but gradually got better. Um, I'm looking it up on my phone because I can't pronounce it right. Um, a, a condition called myasthenia gravis. Now, it sounds horrible. If you look, you can see the gravis. It's right here. Yeah, very good. Um, it's an autoimmune situation where your 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 uh, uh, your 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 communication between the nerves and muscles break down. And um, uh, I I spent forty hours in the hospital, and then they diagnosed what I went in and told them I had. Um. And uh, I did a lot of research on the symptoms. My symptoms were, I got tired really easy. My arms and legs got weak. Uh, I had trouble chewing food. A lot of people thought I was back drinking gin and tonics, which I'm not. Uh, but it sounded like I was. Even my wife at night when we were away, John, she says, I thought you were drinking again. Mm. But I didn't want to say anything. Um but even as I talk to you here, I could feel my my muscles get a little weird. So I might have sound some of the other podcasts might have you go back and listen and say he, he didn't sound right. And so anyhow, so it's it's controllable. They gave me this little pill. It's about that little big, about an inch wide, and a and a quarter of an inch thick. And it's pro it's helped about fifty to sixty percent of what was happening. And I have a uh, appointment with a neurologist in uh, in the University of Tennessee here and a couple of weeks and I'm sure they're going to figure out how to deal with this. Coincidentally, one of our, um, uh, one of our attendees in the Sierra has had this for 22 years and we compare notes. He's been, and, and Mike, if you're listening, thank you so much. Uh, he, he helped me with what to do and how to deal with things quite a bit, but he had the same symptoms. He's been under care, you know, for 22 years. And I wouldn't have known that he had it. Uh, right. 
So it's going to be okay. I'll be back doing some things. Um, but I, I, right now, until I get this under control, <clears throat> I'm going to sit and not do a whole lot. So I'm, I'm thinking by March, we ought to be back at the saddle and we'll see what happens for next year. I've got a lot of good things coming up. I got a big trip with a private group in March up to Alaska that I'm really looking forward to. Um, Bill Fortney and I are going to do Route 66. Yeah, it's still up. I can't wait to get with John and the Palouse in June. And then we'll see what happens after that. I'm not, uh, it, it's going to be fine. But for those of you who sent me the emails, thank you so much. I love you all. You're great. It's going to be okay. But in the time being, boy, what a, it was, a, I was really in bad shape when I got home. I was not in good shape. Yeah. 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 You were tired and it was the right choice to go home early. Yeah. I went sure. home a day early. It's only, the only other time that happens when I have my detached retina. Yeah. And uh, that was, quite a number of years ago but you know or, or when you or when you took a, a wave to the face and hurt your leg and yes 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 yeah yes, there was right. that time too. no it wasn't a wave to the face it was a wave to the I knee know. i know it was a wave a lot of people thought i drowned there because i was underwater. i just wanted to you know relate that you got knocked at you got yeah. your ass kicked <clears throat> yeah yeah yep. yeah yep. but you know now that i'm back talking again sorry y'all <laughs> <laughs> no it's all good it's all good jack well you know, we're here for you and we'll uh we'll keep supporting yeah, no, you listen, any and every way you know we what, can. John? There's a lot of people and I can name them. I can name you some really, really great photographers who unfortunately are in worse shape than I am. And I'm certainly not complaining. Yeah, you know, oh, you yeah. know I'm, I'm I'm alive and I actually feel pretty good other than getting tired uh, after a while. But um yeah, it's it's gonna be fine. So yeah. it's all good. Thank you all for all your thoughts and notes and prayers and everything else so thank you so much yeah, that's awesome now, well let's talk to something important john let's talk about you <laughs> what do you think about me <laughs> no let's let, let's talk about the eastern sierras real quick you know that was kind of our last workshop together and we had a wonderful group down uh down in the eastern part of california and we were there to shoot what else fall color because it both- was that time of year yeah, and, and the Bodie Ghost Town, and the Bodie Ghost Town. So we started in Bishop and, the, and, and the Tufa, Tuf, Tufa, Tufa, Tufa. So we started in Bishop, shot, uh, you know, North Lake, South Lake, went up to the ancient Bristlecone Pine Forest. I tell you, for those that haven't been up to the uh, to the Bristlecone Forest, it's a, uh, it's kind of like the trip up uh, Hunts Mesa in Monument Valley. It's a journey to get up into this rarefied atmosphere of because we were up close to eleven thousand feet and, eleven thousand eight hundred feet yeah i tell you walking around with your camera and your tripod and just trying to work when you're coming from sea level even that's a little bit of a struggle but well, boy. bishop is at forty five hundred feet yeah so you gain you know what uh about seven thousand feet in about 20 miles i think and uh, it could affect you, you know. It can, but it's an amazing place, and it's it's to, to me. I always love the Bristlecone Forest. It's a it's a place that really resonates with me. It's kind of an alien landscape because it's just uh, you know shale rock and these gnarled old trees up in this really barren landscape, and you they have are to, old. They are old, like three They're to four thousand years. The oldest living thing on the planet that we know about. Some of them are over. There's one there over four thousand years old, but they yeah. don't tell you which one, so nobody chops it down. You know how people are. They don't we can't have write nice their things. name on it or some, but oh, yeah, uh, yeah. They're but old. it's a it's a place where you really have to see differently. It's not. Yes, the tree is the obvious subject, but how do you portray it? in this vastness, in this desolate, in this harsh environment. And it's a, every time I visit there, I'm, I'm just gobsmacked at how challenging and beautiful it is. I just enjoy photographing something that's older than me. Yeah. <laughs> that's very, very true. <laughs> yeah. The tree, so, trees probably feel better. <laughs> we had some, we had some, you know, the color was just starting to come on and uh, the last day or the last night i think we were down in bishop it got yep. cold and <clears throat> boy just overnight that cold snap just made the trees scream 
So you can, for those that are watching on YouTube, you can see the image behind me. This is one of the shots from Eastern Sierras and just this incredible amount of gold color, a little bit of orange and red starting to come out. And we had a beautiful, beautiful color event uh, during our time there. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty normal. You can, where I live here near the Smoky Mountains, it's a little more hard to predict, but the aspens tend to pop um, in that area sometimes late, late, late September, but usually the first two weeks of October is the time to be there. Yeah. And, we spent, uh, you know, we, we spent a lot of time shooting the high alpine lakes and the trees, but also teaching people and working with folks to shoot the small stuff, right? Yeah. Leaves falling on the forest floor, <clears throat> arrangements of pine cones underneath the pine trees. There's, there's so much large and small things to shoot that uh, we did just literally didn't have enough time in the day to do everything we wanted to do. Yeah. Yeah. Jack, you made a comment about, about shooting. We, we, we will talk about fall photography a little bit. You made a comment uh, before the program about when you shoot fall photography, you like to have not just the color of the foliage because color <clears throat> color can be the story itself but we like to have a little bit more and that's uh including some of the tree trunks the structure of the trees well I, i'll i'll give credit to that thought to guy tal um you know when i come up with ideas i'm more than happy to tell everybody look how smart i am i came up with this idea but when i'm not i i <clears throat> always give credit and guy He's the one who taught me that. We were up there one year and we were there late and the storm came in and blew half the leaves off. And he was all excited. I said, Guy, I said, the color. He goes, no, it's going to be great. And we went out and he explained this concept. I'll let John expand on it. But um, it, 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 it's, so, it's so there. You can see the body in there, the, 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 the heart of these trees. When they're covered in leaves, you tend to not see. Look, at, John, talk about the picture back in. Well, so so here's an example of this for those that uh, have video. It's a it's a shot of three, primarily three trees that you can see, but it's a forest of trees behind them. And you know, if this shot was just about a wall of color, that's great. The story is color, and I see texture in the leaves. But there's it's kind of one dimensional if you're just shooting fall color. So how do you add more visual interest to an image. And that's it by finding specimens where you can see the trunks of the trees. And I've got three primary trees in this photograph, left, center, and right. And each one, you can see the trunks. And they're balanced. The, yeah, and they're balanced. Well balanced. You know, you can see the trunks amidst the fall foliage and it helps give structure to this. To, you know, to Jack's point, you can see the heart of the trees you can see the heart of the where this color comes from and that adds a, a just sort of a very unique dimensionality to a photograph and so you know for us it's not just shooting fall color it's having to have a structure or a subject beyond just the color in these photographs to help us make an interesting artistic photo in my opinion there's no doubt. You know, it's little things, you know, it reminds me, John, remember when, you know, if you're at the, at, at, on, at an ocean and you're doing like maybe kind of little semi long exposures of the water coming in and out, it makes a big difference when you shoot the water as it's receding without thinking you're going to shoot the wave coming at you. That's human nature. It's what we've done all our lives. When the water receives, it's much more effective shooting trees where you can see you know the arteries of that tree it's going to really i think be much 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 more impactful and i do if you get lucky enough after a rain when those tree trunks are dark it'll really make the color pop as well yeah which in this case i was able to get a couple of these tree trunks dark and notice the other thing there's there's some red happening in this in the tree in one of the trees, there's some red and orange happening. And as we know, you know, red is a very powerful color. And so what did I do is I put that red right in the center of the photograph. 
Because if, if it was off to one of the sides, that's where your eyes would be going. So I chose to put it right in the middle so people stay towards the center of the photograph. So there's little tricks like that for fall photography. But don't forget to look down. That's the biggest thing. I just wrote a blog article and did a video around looking down, looking around. Some of my favorite shots from this last trip were not of the obvious subject that was in front of us. We were at the Tufa. I think I sent you this image. You shot it yes. as well, Jack. That the, we, We're standing on the shores of Mono Lake and we have the Tufa around us, beautiful sunrise. And everybody's shooting the Tufa formations. And I happened to look down, notice the quality of light coming off the water and the color coming off the water. And there was one little branch sticking up out of the water and when I went for a like a 35 second shutter speed on this, smoothed out the water, and I have this beautiful reflection and beautiful color with this lone stick sticking up. And the only reason I saw that is because I slowed down and I looked around and I looked beyond the obvious subject. You know, if you all uh, have time, uh, go to my website and John's website and look under galleries under new work and you'll see some grand landscapes but about equal there's equal amount of images at least on mine that are understated photographs mm -hmm. of different things and you'll get an idea what we're talking about so it's yeah. jackramphoto.com johnpetersonphoto.com galleries new work and you'll see stuff from these last two trips you know? yeah yeah it was very very productive it was wonderful trips and clients had a great fantastic time and uh, yeah, two good groups two great yeah. groups oh yeah a lot of fun Mix yeah, our, we we're very mix our fortunate life really good too um what are we leaving out, John? We talked about what we're going to talk about. Well, um, you know, bored? one of the things I, I talked about uh, before the program started, Jack, is just this. I've said it before, but I'm really deep down into this design thinking theme of, of how I look at a scene and I don't see... A beautiful landscape i see compositional elements and as a designer i look to try to arrange these compositional elements in a pleasing way and or a way that um conveys the story i want to tell um and you know has good balance symmetry harmony all of these types of words and so i it, it's kind of funny as I'm deep into this because I'm I'm working on a project around design thinking and I see myself more as a visual designer than a photographer now. I happen to use a camera, but I'm more of a visual designer and a visual communicator. Just, just because I'm super deep. Just imagine if you moved into a new house, which you basically did. Yeah. And I did in the last year. And, the, and the, the moving van gets here and all your stuff gets out and you just throw it around the room haphazardly. You, you'll go, God, what a mess. We've got to, we got to put the couch here. We got to do this here. But you got to do the same thing, man, with your photographs. It's like, it's like arranging a room. It's like, it's like the, the moving van dumping your stuff in the room. And now what are you going to do with it? Same thing. Yeah. Oh, it is. It is. You, you know, we, we think that we don't have a lot of control over the variables in landscape photography. You know, I don't control the weather. I don't control the sunrise and the sunset. I don't control the shape of the landscape, but I have so much control over what is, is included and what is excluded from my photograph, the height of my camera, the angle of my camera in relation to the subject. Um, the exposures, the shutter speed. I have so much control um, in this sort of fixed scenario of the landscape that I can be and I can flex a lot of artistic muscle with the amount of control that I have. It's it's crazy. You know, too often in image reviews, I know, Jack, you've, you've heard this forever. 
Um, but you know, we're, we'll do an image review and we'll point out something to the photographer and what is the response we often get? Oh, I didn't yeah. see that. Yeah. Oh, well, how did you not see that? Is kind of my, kind of my comeback yeah. question. Cause as a photographer, we need to examine and evaluate everything that's in our composition before you push the shutter button, not after. And, and look around the edges all the time oh, yeah. the last oh, yeah. thing you do is look at your corners and please yeah you can fix it in whatever processing software you use i get that that's not the art the art is to create your piece of art in the camera and then you have something that you can really work with when you get home yep to me anyhow yeah, just kind of my two sets yep yeah being a i mean i'm a visual artist with the camera so i'm not a visual artist with the computer yeah so yeah there is a, there is a distinction there yeah yeah uh, so come on, can, is it my turn to sure okay so you know i i think we i think we've i think you all get what we're trying to say here so you know a lot uh, this is kind of a little insight in, into my world here today. We talked about this situation I'm going through. So that's one thing. But, you know, for those of you who don't know, and if you look in the background, those of you who are, are on YouTube, there's a whole wall of vinyl recordings. For those of you not on YouTube, there's a whole wall of vinyl recordings <laughs> in my room. There's a few thousand. And I listen, I, you know, I, I, you know, I made a living as a musician for a lot of years. So I listen, to, I listen to a lot of music, and there's stuff here from uh, from Charlie Parker to Gustav Mahler. I listen to a lot of stuff. I don't, I don't listen to a lot of rock, but you know, I actually just did get a new record by Steely Dan, and it was redone. I'm going to listen to it tonight. Um, I listen to some, but you know, I I do a jazz channel. And I'm I'm not plugging this. It's not, I don't make any money off this channel at all, not a dime. And it's called Straight Talk with Jack, and it's all about jazz, predominantly jazz, vinyl, some on CD. I do have a lot of CDs, but I really like vinyl better because it sounds better. It's so such a. And the next, uh, the next. The next video that I'm going to shoot, and it'll probably be this week, is going to be my five favorite saxophone players of all time. And I haven't I haven't whittled it down to the exact five yet. I've got about three out of five. So I just want to talk about that for a minute. John's going, oh, what's he doing? It's going to be a disaster. If this is going to hold a crowd here, those of you who are with me, don't leave yet. So in, in no order of importance, Charlie Parker, I'm going to put uh, Lester Young, Ben Webster, and Coleman Hawkins in one. They're, they're all different, but they're all kind of in the same period. Uh, I like Zoot Sims. I like Cannibal Annerly. There's a lot of other guys that probably are not n n names to most people. Kenny G. There's one that I'm really going to, I'm really going to, it has become my favorite saxophone player because this guy has perfected the art exactly what we're teaching you not to do he doesn't slow down he does he does but i i, I, I don't want to get to some people might like this so i don't want to get to this is just an opinion but you know i've gone to i've gone to got to really appreciate anybody that could play a lot of notes in in a short period of time and that would be kenny g ah i knew it and i'm holding up a record for those of you on video that that was given to me as a gift i had the lou nettlehorst great workshop leader and his and todd nettlehorst was here with uh randy dunn was here this weekend we had him over for dinner on sunday and they were kind enough because they know how I love Kenny G. They were kind enough to bring this record and 
give this record to me and it's it's a Kenny G um it's entitled Kenny G new standards mm. and you know it's just you know it's just I mean you know John how much I appreciate Kenny G and oh, of his course ability to play eight million notes within you know four and a half seconds without any any I think, uh, you, I think you're just jealous of his hair ideas. He just kind of wails. He just kind of plays. Yeah. And it's kind of like what happens if you set a tripod up. Kenny, if you're listening to this, man, you know, <laughs> I'm, this is this is good advertising for you. It's people who love you, love you. That's okay, you know. He's he's kind of like the spring prey. Yeah. But like what he does is he 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 doesn't slow down. He doesn't think. He doesn't he, um, he maybe he does. I don't know. But man, it's just it's just kind of That's the opposite gift, of what Jack. we're trying to teach in, in in creating art. Now he sold a lot of records, you know. Mozart made the comment, "The world loves trash." I guess I'm really getting into trash and Kenny G. I don't mean to, yeah. do that, you know. Well, so that's that's a little bit of fun and levity. So now you have yeah, a keep. You can see, from... John. Can you see what's right above Kenny's head that they two, wrote in the record? Z bullets. There's two little. No, we won't want to go into that. Yeah. No, no, no. That might be too negative. We won't. But Todd and Lou and and uh, Ran and and uh, Randy, thank you so much for that. It was really effective. But yeah, I mean Kenny G. If you if you if you want to read about photographic composition, um, listen to Kenny G. When you're doing it, and you'll kind of remember what we're trying to teach here. Well, speaking of which, I, I got in a conversation the other day. I don't know if we've talked about this before, but do you do you listen to music when you process? Yes. Do you think that the type of music that you listen to affects the way you yes. process? Absolutely. It's yeah, absolutely. me too. Absolutely. Um, I went out yesterday morning for a couple hours. I still get out, believe it or not. I'm not I'm not an invalid here. I went out and shot. We got a nice sunrise. And when I came back and processed those images, I listened to the uh it's kind of kind of morbid, um, if you know the story behind it, but I listened to the last movement of Mahler's Ninth Symphony. Um, it's a great history to that. You can read books about it. And uh it, it it you know it's the it's the fall the le things are dying the leaves are coming down we're gonna look at trees with nothing naked trees here for three months and it's it's a time of change and it's a time of um, and that that to me uh, was the mood I wanted to get in when I processed this I didn't want the the three images I processed I was out yesterday morning John. For six hours, I came back with three frames. Yeah, good. Okay, that's a story for another time. Yeah, but I I wanted those to look like fall. I I didn't want to put Charlie Parker playing confirmation. Well, I didn't want to, I don't want to put Harry Anderson. I don't want to put Count Basie on. Yeah. You know, playing Moton Swing. I want it to be in that mood. So I put on the last movement of Mahler's Ninth Symphony. Anybody have it? Listen to it. Yep, I will agree. You know, I I put on music that's appropriate for the image that I'm processing. I don't change music, you know, for every single image. But if I'm working on introspective images, I need something quiet like Keith Jarrett. If if something's just really quick, superficial editing, I don't care what's on. Um, you know, it can just be background music. But it, I'll give it, you all a hint if you all want to try this stuff. Don't listen to music with lyrics yeah. while you're processing, because you'll be listening to the lyrics and not concentrate. Uh, what's what's the singer saying here, rather than just getting into the zone? Yeah, yep, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a good good idea. Yeah, cool. Idea. Maybe we need to do another music uh, and photography thing. We haven't done that in eight months. <laughs> yeah. A lot of good, a lot of good photographers are ex musicians. You know, I know. I those know. of you who haven't heard them, if you search music and photography here on We Talk Photo, you'll hear we did two, three of them, yep. and uh, very informative stuff. Not yeah. so much me, but other the other people we had on. You know, well, anyhow, that's all I have, John. Uh, again, for those of you who sent me emails and stuff, thank you all. 
I'll keep you posted. Life is uh, pretty good and uh, and onward and upward. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome, Jack. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. It's uh, okay. still, I'm trying to get to the finish line here for this year. I've got uh, one more workshop in the Tetons. I'm always looking forward to doing that. Yeah, Sorry, gonna we're going to miss you. Year. Yeah, that's too bad. Got a few presentations to give to various camera clubs around the Northwest, which will be great. Yep. And and then on to 24, you know, Olympics and Palouse and yep. It's gonna be a gonna be a good year. It is. Well, listen, yep. everybody, thank you all for being here. Um, uh, you know, for those of you who are new, uh comments, ideas, questions to we talk photo at gmail.com. And uh, John will get this up, I guess, today, maybe today or tomorrow. Yeah, we'll get it and, up uh, soon. Thank you all for being here. And we'll see you uh, probably about a week with the great Andy Monkford, who's, uh, who's our, we're, I'm really excited to have him with us. And I'm sure you're going to like it too. So check you all later. All right. See you folks. Bye-bye.